In April 1665, people began to die of plague here in what was then the poor suburb of St. Giles in the Fields, on the very outskirts of London. And as the spring grew warmer, the number of cases began to skyrocket. Two months into the outbreak, the number of plague deaths was doubling every fortnight. By the beginning of July, 470 people a week were dying, and thousands more were falling sick. The deaths were overwhelmingly in the poor suburbs to the west of the walled city of London, but the contagion was now spreading east. Terrified by this spiralling epidemic, most better off Londoners now decided to try and escape the city. Tens of thousands of people fled London in the greatest exodus in the city's history. The people that fled were those that could afford to. The merchants, the lawyers, the professional classes. And the streets were clogged with coaches and carts piled high with servants, clothing and prized possessions. Almost every noble family also escaped London including King Charles II, who fled to his palace at Hampton Court, 10 miles away. Mostly, it was the poor who were left behind. They had no choice. They needed to keep working to survive, and they had nowhere else to go. And it was in the back alley slums where they lived that the plague was already most rampant. St. Bart's Hospital was one of the few places that the poor who were trapped in London could come hoping to receive treatment. I'm here to have a look at their archives to see what they tell us about the care they received. Archivist Kate Jarman has found original documents revealing that even hospitals offered limited help to plague victims. So, Kate, this is the hospital journal, is that right? That's right. It's actually the minutes of the, the Board of Governors of the hospital. So it's really a record of the day-to-day -day life of the hospital, activities of the staff. So it's like the hospital diary? Yeah. And what does it say about the Great Plague? The record says the hospital did not admit incurable patients. So it's probably unlikely that they were admitting patients for the plague. These, these may well have been patients admitted with other symptoms or who developed the, the symptoms of the plague while they were here. In fact, the hospital was implementing measures to keep contagion out, locking the gates early uh, and, and making sure that goods brought into the hospital were as risk-free as possible. One of the uh, interesting things is, is the record of what was happening with the medical staff. So here we can see the governors have ordered that the £100 due to Dr Micklethwaite and Dr Turns not be paid to them. And that's because they'd actually left London. They decided that the, the city was, was too contagious and in common with a lot of people of their class, they would have got out of town. I mean, I can understand why they left, but it doesn't feel like what doctors should be doing. Yeah, but I think what's also interesting really is the stories of those who did stay. People like Margaret Blake, who was the, the matron of the hospital at that time. So she was responsible for the 15 nursing sisters who looked after the wards of the hospital. The record says, having respect towards Margaret Blake, matron, for her attendant and constant great pains about the poor in making them broths, cordials and other like comfortable things for their accommodation in these late contagious times wherein she hath adventured herself to the great risk of her life. Wow, I love that. She adventured herself to the great risk of her life. You know, there's a clear understanding that she, she'd put herself at risk to, to care for patients. Just like NHS nurses today. Absolutely. You definitely feel very aware that the less paid, less trained, less valued healthcare workers have stayed and done the heroic work. Absolutely. Other physicians did bravely stay in London throughout the Great Plague. One was William Boghurst, an apothecary, an early type of pharmacist. He made a vivid record of his attempts to treat up to 40 patients a day. He dressed buboes, the swellings that formed on necks and groins. 
He held people as they thrashed and raged, overcome by unimaginable pain and fever. And he stayed with them in their final hours, closing their eyes when they died. So apart from a handful of heroes, almost everyone in authority seems to have chosen to abandon the poor of London to their fate. The outbreak was only just beginning. Things were about to get worse than anyone could imagine. In mid-July 1665, the official number of weekly deaths in London surpassed a thousand. 54 of the capital's 130 parishes were now infected. With most aristocrats and professionals attempting to escape London, it was mainly people such as labourers and servants who were left behind. Before King Charles fled to the countryside, he handed responsibility for plague relief and control to the Lord Mayor of London, who was based right here at the Great Guildhall. The mayor was Sir John Lawrence, a wealthy merchant who'd been elected the previous year. He now had to enforce regulations to try and control the spread of the disease. One of the Lord Mayor's jobs was to issue certificates of health to the thousands of people wanting to flee London. Without these certificates, they'd be turned away from inns, they might even be turned away from towns and villages by guards. So thousands of people gathered here, desperate to prove they weren't sick and to get their certificates. The author Daniel Defoe tells us there was no getting to the Lord Mayor's door here without exceeding difficulty. Such was the pressing and the crowding, but unfortunately, those conditions are ideal for the transfer of human body lice, and many of the people trying to escape the plague may have caught it right here. This is the Great Hall where the Lord Mayor conducted business, and it seems he took sensible precautions to avoid catching the plague himself. We're told the Mayor had a special gallery built. He would stand on it, keeping himself removed from the mass of people that had come to petition him. It allowed him to be seen, but at a suitably safe distance. Sir John didn't know plague was spreading through body lice and human fleas, but he had learnt from experience that social distancing worked. And despite dealing with hundreds, maybe thousands of people, and working here throughout the Great Plague, Sir John lived for another 27 years. It seems his gallery did the trick. To control the spread, the mayor had ordered the shutting up of infected houses, a system of quarantine established in earlier plague epidemics. It's the ancestor of the measures used to combat COVID-19. Searchers were employed to visit houses where sickness had been reported to verify it was plague. They carried a white stick to identify themselves so everyone else could avoid them. So many had lost their jobs when employers fled London, there was no shortage of desperate people willing to take on this dangerous job. If a plague victim was found, the house was locked up with the entire family inside, whether they were sick or not. A red cross was then painted on the door, along with the prayer, Lord, have mercy upon us. Watchers then guarded the house day and night to ensure no one escaped. If rats, not body lice, were spreading plague, this system would have been not only brutal, but pointless. Rats could still have moved around freely, spreading the disease between houses. 
But would enforced quarantine have stopped transmission by body lice and human fleas? Raksha has gone to investigate. I've come to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I'm meeting Professor James Logan to learn more about the behaviour of human lice and fleas. The thing about lice is that they're hugely adapted to living on us and they can't survive when they're not on us. And the reason that they live on us is because they suck our blood. There are different types of lice that, that you can have. So we're, we're very familiar with head lice, but there is a very closely related species. In fact, it's kind of the same species, really, the, the body lice. Um, and it's, it's very similar in terms of its behavior, but body lice, they've kind of evolved to live on clothing. So one thing we know about body lice in particular is that they're capable of transmitting diseases. So head lice can't really do it, but body lice can. And some of these diseases are pretty serious, like typhus or trench fever. And of course, now we know that they're also capable of transmitting the plague. So I can actually show you some. I've got some live lice here. These are head lice. Body lice are incredibly rare in Britain today. Well, let me see if I can just find one that looks nice and active. So I'll put my arm under the microscope here and pop it on. OK. It's grim. It's, it's completely latched on, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's going for it. It's actually feeding off you. Yeah, you can see. And look, can you see the blood there? Yeah. It's like pulsating in. Rather you than me. Ugh. If a body louse is infected with plague, their bite injects the bacteria into the victim, which then travels to the nearest lymph node, where they multiply rapidly to produce buboes, the swellings that give bubonic plague its name. If you've got body lice, how then do you then spread it to me? They are incredibly infectious. Uh, they're designed not just to live on us, but also to spread to other people as well. They've got hooks on the end of their feet, essentially on the end of their legs, uh, which they use not just to cling on, but to cling on to something passing by as well. Imagine if I had thousands and thousands of lice, they would get onto you pretty easily. But some of them can actually even crawl we reckon they can crawl sort of four or five metres in a day. And when they're off the host, they're incredibly uncomfortable. So they're going to do everything that they possibly can to get back onto something that's alive and going to give them blood. If sick people's clothes were infested with body lice, they could spread the disease by simply brushing past someone. And following death, the infected lice would leave the corpse in search of a new host. OK, so that was lice. What about fleas? Well, I've got some fleas here. There are lots of different types of fleas. So some fleas are adapted to live on us and feed on our blood. Other fleas are designed to live on other animals like rats or, or cats or dogs. For a hundred years, it was believed only rat fleas could spread plague. But the new research has revealed human fleas can pass it directly, person to person. Look, it's got those jumpy long legs, hasn't it? Yeah, that's right, and that's what everybody associates with fleas, is their brilliant ability to jump and hop around the place, and that's how they get onto us. So they don't live on us like body lice do. These guys actually live in the environment, so they'll live in, in your home, in any sort of upholstery or textiles. Then when a host comes along and it feels the vibration and it senses the carbon dioxide given off by our breath, it kind of wakes it up and it will come out and, and start to blood feed on us. They don't tend to go very far. They will move around a little bit, but they wouldn't tend to move from house to house themselves. The behaviour of human fleas and lice suggests that quarantining would have been effective at preventing wider plague transmission. But the disease would have torn through families trapped in infested homes with sick relations. Shutting up would have been horrific for the unfortunate families. It would have been a probable death sentence, but it would have stopped the disease spreading to other families. But just as with self-isolation during the coronavirus epidemic, for the system to be effective, it required compliance. In 1665, people widely concealed cases of plague to avoid being shut up, and many others distracted watchers and escaped. The rejection of the system was
was strikingly demonstrated here at the Ship Tavern in Hoburn. In the spring of 1665, there was an outbreak of plague in this 450-year-old tavern. Now, the landlord and his family were shut up by the authorities. A red cross was painted on the door and watchmen were put on guard. Well, this did not go down well with the locals who rioted to set them free. It was reported that the door was opened in a vicious manner and the people of the house permitted to go abroad into the streets promiscuously with others. Well, this enraged the authorities who ordered that the justices of the peace inflict upon the rioters the severest of punishments. The failure of shutting up to contain the epidemic was clear as the death rate spiraled ever higher. So a range of additional regulations was issued by the Lord Mayor. So this is an original copy of the orders conceived and published by the Lord Mayor concerning the infection of the plague. So we've got the watchmen here, we've got the searchers, we've got shutting up of houses. But a lot of these orders don't seem to make any sense if you believe that plague is spread by rats. It looks more like the superstitions of ignorant people. But if the plague is being spread by human body lice, then these orders read quite differently. So this, maybe to me, is the most special one. The order says no infected stuff to be uttered. Well, let me explain what that means. It says no clothes, stuff, bedding or garments should be carried or conveyed out of any infected houses. Effectively, they have shut down the second-hand clothing trade. You can't display them, you can't take any money for them, and if you buy clothes from infected houses, your own house will be shut up as infected and that shall continue shut up for 20 days at the least. So this order reflects the widespread conviction at the time that clothes and garments were responsible for spreading the plague. Now they hadn't made the exact connection with human body lice, but they did seem to know more than we thought about the way the disease was spread. And John Sargent has gone to look at what people were wearing in the 17th century and the role that played in spreading the plague. Susan Vincent has researched the link between body lice and clothes and how the different clothing worn by rich and poor determined how vulnerable they were to plague. Well, hello. Hello, John. Nice to see you. You look terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, so you're dressed as what? A, 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 a very well-off woman. I would be a woman of the upper middling sort, so rather wealthy, but not of the very elite. Right, now you're all dressed up, but I'm not. What would I be wearing? Oh, well, we have some clothes here for you to try on. Yes. This is going to be... <laughs> this should be fun. Right. OK, see you in a moment. Good luck. Like Susan, I'm dressing as a wealthy Londoner. Right, well, what do you think? John, terrific. That's well, wonderful. I don't know. I don't feel very dressed. Well, the reason I've kept you in the underwear is that this is very important for the plague because right. lice would be in this underlayer next to your skin. Right, and the lice would be like to be living next to my skin. They do want a good feed. And so, being wealthy, you would be able to change your underwear layer daily. And in doing so, this would get rid of any potential lice problems. Right, so I wouldn't know about the connection with the plague or anything like that. I just think, oh, I want to change my clothes. Yes. And I've got plenty of clothes. And it's the decent and clean and hygienic thing to do. Peeps. He had trouble, didn't he, with lice? He did on one occasion. It was very rare for him, and he writes about it in his diaries just because it is so rare. The famous diarist Samuel Pepys stayed in London through most of the Great Plague to continue his crucial work as a senior naval administrator. He didn't flee the city when most people of his class did. His lice infestation occurred a few years after the plague. The story is that he'd been feeling itchy for nearly a week and he went to Elizabeth and asked her to check his clothing and check his hair. And indeed, he did have lice. They found about 20, which he says was more than he had had in 20 years and, and worried him because he didn't know where they'd come from. 
but he shifted his clothes, he took his shirt off, changed his undergarments, and had Elizabeth cut his hair close to get rid of the head lice. Right, so even the great peeps... Even the great peeps. ...had lice. Right, so how's that feeling then, John? It's good, no, it's great. Terrific. Well, you're not quite there yet. We still have one more piece to come, right. and that's your wig or your periwig. Periwig, right. Sometimes they call it a peruke. OK. How's that? I don't want to cover your eyes there. Wow. So the wig is rather splendid, but you do have to be careful with wigs because Pepys had just begun to wear wigs and he was particularly worried during the plague that the hair had been cut off someone who had died of the plague. A good cheap source of hair. Ooh, grim. Grim indeed. The rich, like Pepys, were understandably deeply concerned about the possible ways of contracting plague. But the fact body lice infestations for them were so rare made them much less susceptible to the disease. Right. Oh. However, it was a very different situation for the poor. How's that feel then? It's, <laughs> it's good, but it's quite smart, isn't it? Well, you've got to remember that this might be your only outfit of clothes, and so you, it's looking good now, but after you've worn it continually during the day, it would be a lot less smart. And when I go to bed at night, what happens then? Well, your shirt underneath, if you were very poor, you would sleep in your shirt. So if there were lice inside the shirt, and this was my only shirt, I would go to bed and the lice would breed. And um, you would be stuck with them sitting against your body day and night. Yeah. Pretty awful. Definitely. But while the poor would suffer most as the plague continued its rampage, soon no one would be safe. And that included those rich people who had decided to stay in London. By the end of July 1665, nearly 300 Londoners a day were dying of plague. The disease had spread from the western suburbs to almost every area of the city. The northern suburbs of Clerkenwell and Shoreditch were now the worst hit. The death toll reached 6,774. Samuel Pepys was one of the few wealthy elite who had stayed in London. Although still predominantly affecting the poor neighbourhoods, plague now reached his wealthy parish of St. Olav Hart Street. He says he heard the death knell ringing out from his church five or six times a day. Along with everyone else who could, he self-isolated and rarely left his home. And this was just one of the ways that the people who stayed in London began to change their behaviour in an effort to save themselves. When they did have to leave the house, they tried to stay in the centre of the street to avoid getting infected from the houses on either side. And the streets became increasingly deserted. And if you did encounter anyone, you tried to keep a safe distance. People still needed food and supplies, and some shops remained open. The rich like Peeps sent their servants, everyone instinctively took precautions. Morning. Morning, sir. Can I get a shoulder of lamb, please? You certainly can. Now, when people came to the butcher's shop to get fresh meat, they had to put their payment in coins into vinegar rather than handing the money over directly. There you go. Unlike COVID-19, plague is a bacterium, not a virus. And vinegar does have antibacterial properties, although it's not known if it kills plague. Thank you very much. Shoulder lamb's hanging just over there, sir. The shopper would then take their purchase directly off the hook, avoiding any personal contact with the butcher. It's the same social distancing we use in epidemic control today. Although at the time people weren't sure how plague was being transmitted, through experience, they knew to keep away from others. And because body lice are transferred by close contact, this would have been effective. Particularly extreme precautions are believed to have been taken by those doctors that didn't leave London. It's thought that they wore a downright sinister protective outfit when visiting plague patients. Raksha has gone to find out if this outfit really existed 
and how effective it may have been. I've come to the London Dungeons. Here they have a replica of a plague doctor's clothing as part of their creepy Plague Street experience. But this outfit is so horrific. I wonder if it's a myth. Part of this spooky Halloween version of the plague. To find out, I'm meeting historian Dr. Philippa Hellowell. Well, I'm not gonna lie, this scares the bejesus out of me. I can see that would be a really good fancy dress costume, but how is this based in reality? So there are a lot of sources from the 17th century which suggest that plague doctors walked around in an outfit similar to this. So where does this costume actually originate from then? It was developed by a French physician called Charles Delon who served three successive French monarchs. This is actually a German source talking about the use of this costume. The gentleman here is described as Dr. Beak. So this outfit relates to the very common theory of miasma, which is the idea that disease is caused through poisonous vapours going through the air. And we can see that reflected in the mask, this kind of beaked quality of the mask. It's designed to actually store sweet smelling substances, perfumes, things like lavender, which are designed to kind of protect the wearer from those bad, those poisonous, foul smelling odours from coming into the body. And also we see that the majority of the body is covered as well. What was this all made out of? So this would typically be made out of cotton or linen which was sealed with wax. Well, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because in the 17th century, they wouldn't have known about bacteria being spread through lice and fleas. And if this was covered in wax, this would be a barrier. They would just literally drop off. It's pretty effective. We do have the 17th century monk in Genoa who is saying how wearing something like this, you know, protects him from being bitten by fleas and lice. Um, and so it certainly had its practical advantages. I mean, I'm going to put this on. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? It's quite, it's quite effective because it's sealed at the bottom. I mean, you can't see very much, but if you've got glass on that, then it would protect you from people sneezing on you, wouldn't it? Mm, yeah. I think what comes through is actually the logic of it all covering the skin and covering the face, having glasses, lenses over your eyes, was seen as quite an effective way to protect yourselves. So as scary as this seems and as ridiculous as it looks, it's almost like a modern day hazmat suit. I mean, it's quite effective, isn't it? There's definitely method to the madness. So while a version of this outfit was worn in Europe, there's no evidence doctors were stalking the streets of London wearing it. No one from the time mentions it, and I think they probably would. In the second week of August 1665, there were a shocking 3,880 plague deaths. About 6% of Londoners who'd stayed had now died. It was still the poor northern suburbs around Shoreditch that were bearing the brunt and a majority of their population were now falling sick. The worst affected parishes were also overwhelmed by dead. Some of them had to somehow bury 600 people a week. They didn't have the manpower to collect all the bodies or dig all the graves, and many of the churchyards were completely full. The Lord Mayor realised that soon thousands of bodies would be left unburied in houses and in the streets. So a burial operation on an almost industrial scale was begun. Dozens of carters were hired to collect the dead. These dead carts patrolled the streets at night. A bell ringer walked ahead to call to families to bring out their dead, but also to warn others to steer clear of the infected corpses they carried. These were then transported to huge burial pits that had been dug outside the city walls. According to the famous author Daniel Defoe, one of the greatest pits of all was dug here next to the church of St. Botolph in Oldgate, just outside the old eastern city wall. 
Daniel Defoe tells us that this dreadful gulf was actually beneath my feet. It was 40 feet long, extending almost to the end of the alley. It was 15 feet wide, so about the width of this alley, and it was 20 feet deep. They only stopped digging when they hit the water table. To find out who was buried in this pit, I'm meeting plague historian Vanessa Harding. Hi, Vanessa. Very nice to see you. I've just been pacing out the plague pit outside. I think you've got the, the church records from the same period. Yes, these are the registers for September 1665. And what kind of things are we seeing at that time? This is one of the largest parishes and it's one of the highest death tolls anywhere. We start on this page. This is the 8th of September. This is one day. Starts there, mm -hmm. runs right down this page. Something like 90 people are buried in one day. I mean, that's amazing. Yes. So 90 deaths in a single day. Yes. There's no way you can put those people in normal traditional graves and have funerals, is there? No, no. Uh, they're not even burying in coffins anymore. And they're in, they're in mass graves. They're in plague pits at this point. Most of them, yes. It's clearly one of the traumatic sides of the epidemic as a whole is that it destroys the ways in which people are used to taking care of the dead, paying proper respect, being able to see them into a grave. I think people find this whole thing of large numbers of bodies just being tossed in together uh, very, very disturbing. So Defoe says that that huge pit out there, in two weeks it was filled with bodies, that they had 1,114 people in that pit. Does that fit with the data you've got from the register? Absolutely, yes. Wow. So what do you see if you look at the list of names here? We can see that it's right across the parish, but they're also mostly coming from the poorer areas, from the alleys. So there's Woolsack Alley, Harrow Alley, Three Kings Alley, Gravel Lane, Squirrel Alley, Still Alley. So the wealthier people would have lived on the high street? Yes. And we don't see the high street coming up very much here? Just one or two names. This was because by this time, most of the rich houses on the high street would have been empty. Because by midsummer, up to 20% of London's population had fled. By the end of August, a shocking 7% of those who remained had died. And over 6,000 more were dying each week. Anyone who'd stayed in the city was now losing friends and family. Thomas Vincent was a Puritan minister who lived in Spitalfields throughout the plague in a household of eight people. He'd had 16 close friends he used to see every week. Now, only four were left alive. That August, from his window, he witnessed terrible scenes of tragedy every day, including a woman forced to bury, with her own hands, her last child. You couldn't walk through London that terrible August without coming across plague-ridden people limping through the streets. So Samuel Pepys preferred to travel by boat on the Thames to avoid the sick but he got a terrible shock one evening coming up the steps from the river when he stumbled upon a plague corpse in the darkness. By midsummer, it's thought that 80,000 people had fled London and hundreds more were holed up on boats lined all the way along the Thames as far as the eye could see. But the countryside was no longer a safe haven. The refugees had taken the plague with them and the epidemic would spread across Britain. In the first week of September 1665, 7,000 people died of the plague here in London. It was a far higher death toll than on any previous week. 31,000 people had already died in London alone. And worse was to come, because now the disease began appearing in other towns. I believe people fleeing London had carried it with them on their lice-infested clothes. Most towns near London saw outbreaks. 
Infected goods were blamed for causing particularly severe epidemics in the cloth-making towns of Braintree, Colchester and Norwich. Most were in the south and east of England, but one outbreak stands out from all the others. Eam is a picturesque village far from London, tucked away in a valley deep in the Derbyshire Peak District. Even today, it's miles from anywhere. Looking at the village down there, it couldn't be further removed from the crowds and grime of London. And that was as true 350 years ago as it is today. But that pretty village would suffer one of the most terrible outbreaks of the Great Plague in all of Britain. In the 17th century, Eam was home to about 700 people. It was in these actual cottages that the Great Plague arrived in Eam in the first week of September 1665. And this was intriguingly early because it hadn't even reached some parishes in London at this point. And yet somehow it had jumped all the way up here to the heart of the Peak District. And once again, the outbreak was blamed on a consignment of cloth. The story goes, that consignment was sent from London to a tailor in Eam. A servant, George Vickers, opened the box and discovered the goods were damp. He was ordered to dry them out by the fire. By doing this, he somehow, tragically, contracted the plague. In recent times, the story has been dismissed as a myth. The crucial question for me is could plague really be spread by shipments of cloth and clothing? It's blamed in so many outbreaks, and it only really makes sense if you believe, like I do, that the disease is mainly spread by human clothes lice rather than by rats. But any infected lice in the box wouldn't have been able to feed. There was no one to suck blood from. So could they have survived the many days it would have taken a cart to travel from London to Eam. Raksha has gone to find out. I've returned to see Professor James Logan, who's been running an experiment on lice survival. So we know that this box of damp cloth arrived from London to Eam. What are the chances of body lice actually surviving in that consignment of cloth? So basically, we wanted to find out how long these guys can survive when they're off the hosts. It's very hard to get hold of body lice. So we've used head lice, which are very similar. So we, we managed to get some head lice um, 10 days ago. We put them in an incubator at their optimum temperature and optimum humidity. After 24 hours, about 80% of them had actually died. After two days, 90% had died. But by day five, there was still one louse alive. It was, it was quite incredible. That's remarkable, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, we know head lice tend not to survive as long as, as body lice, and yet even in this experiment, um, we've shown that one louse could survive five days. So with body lice, they'd be surviving a good few days beyond that as well. So there would, I, I would be very convinced that there would be lice still alive under those conditions um, in that box. But there is potentially another way that it could be transmitted, and that's through their feces. There's one thing about insects that feed on blood and that's that they poo a lot oh, gosh, and, and you can see all the poo on that piece of paper let's have a look at it under the microscope so you can see how much poo there is there i mean they're absolutely minuscule you can barely see an individual mm. poo uh, with the naked eye but there you can see how many there are and inside that poo uh, the bacteria can actually survive and be transmitted onwards and basically what happens because it's really really dusty if you were to sort of shake the cloth the poo would be airborne it could go into your into your lungs and infect you that way um, or if you've got a cut on the skin the poo could get in that way which means the bacteria would get in and that's another way that the infection possibly could have started this experiment has shown the story of how the contagion spread to Eam may be true the box could have contained lice-infested clothes from a plague victim, or the person who packed it could have been ill. 
And even if no lice had survived, their feces may have infected the servant George Vickers. And his death, shortly after unpacking the box, began a terrible chain of events in Eam. We know from wills and parish records that the first person to die, the servant George Vickers, lived in that cottage there. A fortnight later, Edward Cooper, only four years old, who also lived in that cottage, died. A day later, Peter Hawksworth, their neighbour at that end, died. And then a few days after that, Thomas Thorpe and his daughter Mary, the neighbours on this side, also died. This was only the beginning for the villagers. The disease would continue to spread. And next time we'll discover how it led to an extraordinary act of self-sacrifice by the people of Eam. In London, the death rate remained unrelentingly high. By the 11th of September, over 37,000 people had died. In desperation, the Lord Mayor ordered great bonfires be lit in the streets in the belief that the smoke would drive out the miasmas thought to be spreading the disease. Samuel Pepys watched in awe and fear as they blazed across the city. But of course, it was hopeless. The epidemic still had not reached its peak. In the next episode, we discover how the plague overwhelmed the authorities. Almost worse to have survived it and having lost five children and your husband. We investigate the medical treatments plague victims endured. You could heat that up, place it into the bubo to burn it. The pain would have been agonising. We learn how the villagers of Eam made the ultimate sacrifice. It's almost like facing a certain death. And we'll discover how the country finally began to emerge from the horrific pandemic.